Hi, this is George Stalker. Today we're going to talk about hexagonal architecture, commonly known as ports and adapters. Now you may wonder, what does hexagonal architecture have to do with test-driven development? And the answer is pretty much everything. Uh, test-driven development is a way to drive your architecture to make it easier to test, easier to change, and to provide more value faster. Hexagonal architecture is a necessary complement to this. What hexagonal architecture allows you to do is it allows you to set up the core of your system and in that core, we call the domain, uh, all of your business logic resides. The outside world, uh, the parts where you talk to the database or to the user interface or to your event queue, uh, those are handled uh, through ports and their corresponding adapters. Now let's start on the domain first. A domain is a really weird term if you're not used to hearing it. Uh, it comes from domain-driven architecture, or excuse me, dom domain-driven design, uh, which refers to the problem space that your application exists in. I'm trying really hard not to use the word domain in the definition. Um, and that is, for instance, if I were creating a golfing application uh, to keep golfing scores, the domain uh, of that system would be golf. So in golf, there are terms uh, of art like par, uh, slice, hook, drive, uh, greens and regulation. And all of those terms are golf specific terms. They have meaning inside of that domain. A green outside of a domain is a color, but inside of a domain uh, of golfing, it uh, refers to the putting surface. So if I were writing a uh, golfing score uh, tracker, I need to know when a user has hit a green in regulation. That's part of keeping score in golf. So in my application, if I'm developing it, I want to model that domain concept somewhere. Now, I could get away with not doing that. I could say, you know what? I'm a software developer. I don't need to know about greens and regulation. I don't need to carry around that concept. To me, it's just uh, a way to increment or decrement a statistic. It's not anything important. And you're right, that's true. To a software developer, it's not important. But what if you're talking to a user and they say, hey, this application doesn't track greens and regulation correctly. You say to them, well, okay, let me find in the system where it does that. It's going to be hard to find unless you know the system intimately and you've mapped your concepts as a software developer to your customer's concepts. Writing software in the domain that it's modeled in makes this easier. It allows you to say, oh, where's the logic that deals with greens and regulation? And in fact, hopefully a simple code search for greens and regulation or GIR, and you find it. That's just the outermost layer of value that you get from writing software modeled through your domain. The second part, deeper part, is that it allows you and the customer or you and the product owner to speak the same language while you're developing the software. In your meetings to say, hey, you know, how do we model fairways hit on a par four? And for the customer to say, wow, developers speaking my language. This is good makes them easier to understand than things like add-ins and uh, increment and decrement and terms that would you know, be used primarily inside of our application that have meaning to us but may not have meaning to customers. Modeling the domain um, is, is one part that's covered in the book uh, Domain Driven Design. One of the parts that the domain ties into are other um, are the user interface are the database we need a way to persist green some regulation we need a way to persist scores and that's where the ports and adapters come in uh, 
Now the port, you can just think of my connection to the outside world, to things that aren't my application or aren't central to the domain logic in my application or business logic if you prefer. We'll say domain because that uh, goes beyond business logic. The port is I have to connect to a database, not physically, but the, the operational aspect of connecting to a beta database. In other words, databases have, if you're using a relational database, they have transactions. You need a way to model that. They have connections. You need a way to model that. Um, they have rollbacks when something goes wrong. You need a way to model that. But should that really seep into your application logic? You know, should your application have to know that a transaction failed? Probably not. Like your domain doesn't care about that. In fact, your domain, what they really care about is, you know, did we already have a score for this hole? But the application itself doesn't have any understanding of persistence. It just knows that if I write down a score, it's going to stay. And so all of those concerns that aren't application concerns are, or excuse me, aren't domain concerns, are application concerns. It's handled inside the port and its corresponding adapter. So you can think of a port as um, I'm using Entity Framework, or I'm connecting the database directly, and I'm using uh, a data reader uh, or a data adapter uh, in .NET. And that code uh, is going to be isolated from my domain logic. Now, if you remember the three-tier or N-tier architectures, you'll remember, yeah, we did that. We had presentation layer, and business logic layer, and then uh, data access layer. But this goes deeper than that. Um, this goes into ensuring that it's not just a translation between the layers. They are wholly separate. In other words, if I need to sort my scores. I have a domain modeled method to do that without having to worry about its implementation logic, without injecting a database into it. That's handled through an adapter. And this uh, calls back to the adapter design pattern from the Gang of Four design patterns, where you have a uh, an interface that is not um, implementation specific. It's not entity framework specific. It's not, uh, I'm using a data reader specific. And it has a domain concept such as you know, sort or um, save score. And between that and the port uh, is where that translation happens from this is a domain concern, I'm saving the score, to this is a uh, database concern of I have a transaction and I need to ensure that that transaction gets committed. When you do this, um, this allows you to write code and to test the domain of your system, which hopefully is the bulk of your system, um, and allow it to change without changing uh, how you talk to the outside world. Now, the database is the most common um, port um, used, um, but think about your user interface. Let's say this is an Angular application, or this is a XAML, um, and Xamarin-driven mobile application. You also want to ensure that um, you can test it quickly without worrying about loading up all of the Xamarin front end. Same thing if it were a console application or a web application. By separating out the framework you're using, you can imagine that UI framework you're using, be it XAML, um, be it Xamarin, be it uh, ASP.NET Core, or be it a REST API even. You want to separate that from your the guts of your application, from the actual logic from your application. The reason for that is you don't want to have to load up an entire stack to write your tests or to run your tests. That takes you know, test execution from milliseconds to seconds. And by 
separating out your UI framework, you're able to make your tests faster. Now, this is why hexagonal architecture is so important to test-driven design. If one of the benefits of test-driven design is that it allows you to make changes to your application faster, and it allows you to understand what your code changes affect faster, then slowing down your test by several orders of magnitude is not good. The important part, the most important part of hexagonal architecture is ensuring that you have the appropriate adapters in place, that you create some sort of scar tissue between you, the domain of your application, and your external, uh, the external world. Now you can think of the external world as anything um, that really isn't about what your application does. It's more about how, how your application is delivered or how things are done. And all of those things you want to separate from your code as much as possible. Now in the style of TDD that I teach, uh, FOO, you can do this through domain primitives and through uh, framework primitives so that you are not injecting um, an entity framework database context you know, into your domain. You should never do that. Now, one of the ancillary uh, benefits, and people call this a benefit, and I've never actually seen it come to fruition, is that this also allows you to change out your databases if you want. Say you don't want to use SQL Server. Say you want to move to Postgres. Yes, having a hexagonal architecture allows you to do that. But let's be realistic. That's not a common requirement. We may think we want it, but after 15 years in this industry, I have yet to see uh, that happen and that come to fruition without a whole lot of work. So when someone says, hey, use an ORM, you get to switch out your, your database. Yeah, you could, but I wouldn't count on it. Um, but by using hexagonal architecture, you are able to ensure that the meat of your system, the part that you rely on to make business decisions off of, stays consistent and stays easily testable and easily changeable, even in the face of moving from a web application to a mobile application. So that is it today on hexagonal architecture. Uh, hit reply and let me know how you feel about this. Thanks.